So I think we can begin the second session on dignity. As I said before, we inverted the order of the lectures this morning because Professor Brown's word unfortunately won't be here with us. Uh, due to a strike of uh, British Airways, uh, his flight was cancelled. So he wrote us, he sent uh, us uh, his paper. He is very sorry, and I'm very sorry for this. But I'm also very grateful to Professor Duell, uh, who accepted to play the double role. Uh, I mean, he will summarize Brown's word paper and discuss it at the same time. So. Now only a few words to introduce them, also because it sounds strange to um, introduce someone who is absent. Uh, the, the speaker of this second session now on dignity should have been Roger Brownswood. Roger Brownswood is professor uh, of law at King's College and Bournemouth University. The title of his paper is Migrants, State Responsibilities and Human Dignity. Uh, Roger Bronsworth is an internationally known scholar, and uh, his research and publication covers a wide range from bioethics to contract law to the regulation of new technologies. Among his um, scientific production, I remember only the last book, Law, Technology, and Society, Reimagining the Regu Regulatory Envir Environment for Routledge. And, uh, but in this context, I think it's worth remembering his seminal work uh, in bioethics and biolaw, often carried out with Derek Baileveld, which, among others' publication, led to the book Human Dignity in Bioethics and Biolaw. The concept of dignity is at the core also of Marcus Dual research. So, I'm very glad he accepted to discuss and now also to summarize Brown's work paper. Uh, Marcus Lewis is professor at, of philosophical ethics at Utrecht University. He's, he's one of the members of Nova Migra research team. And he is also director of uh, the Ethics Institute always of Utrecht University. Uh, in this case, uh, for the sake of brevity, so I remember only uh, the, that he is among the editors and the authors of the Cambridge Handbook of Human Dignity and of the book, who is in preparation for Cambridge University Press, China's, which is called China's and Western Perspective on Human Dignity, Contribution from Philosophy and Applied Ethics. So I think it's a very well person I think for introduce this uh, um, session, and I really thank him again. Please, Marcus. Yeah. Thanks a lot for uh, the invitation and for the organization of the conference to uh, Nicola and you. Um, my job is a bit. Can you hear me at the end? Is it? OK. Um, yeah, my job is a bit difficult to summarize the paper of which is quite long and um, a bit complex in the argument. I will uh, do my best to highlight the main aspects of it. So <clears throat> the paper, the title of the paper is Migrants, State Responsibilities, and Human Dignity. And uh, in the paper, um, Roger tries to make sense of the use of human dignity in concepts of regulations and treatments of migrants and refugees. Um, and I think the paper is, it introduces a variety of distinctions which are helpful for the further debate. Uh, I haven't said that I'm not uh, fully convinced of all the steps of it. I personally would have framed it in some points a bit different, but that's more, uh, the differences are more from technical nature and are more relevant for the further elaboration, but I fully, I'm fully convinced about the 
conceptual starting point of the entire story. So uh, I try to give you an idea of what the paper is about, and then I will relate myself to it. I, I will try to distinguish the summary from my comment, but I'm not fully sure that that will uh, be successful at all stages. Um, so Roger starts with uh, the obvious observation that dignity is a contest concept and the way we should treat refugees and migrants as contested, so combining both uh, <coughs> seems to create a big chaos. Uh, even so, chaos is the word from me. Um, <coughs> even so, one could think that perhaps the, the point that uh, um, refugees are treated in sometimes degrading way could be something that would be a first hypothesis would be something where human dignity could be applied quite straightforwardly. Uh, and Roger will take some a nuanced position in that. Uh, he starts with the observation that the two relevant uh, United Nations global com uh, compacts, one for safety, orderly, and regular migration, and the other on uh, uh, refugees, that both are not referring to dignity in an extensive way. So their position is, in an explicit sense, not fully clear. So we have to do some uh, analysis. Um, uh, and in a uh, further step, he relates uh, the topic to a statement of 800 bioethicists in the US who say that um, the US governments are treating particular migrant children in a way that's violate basic principle of medical ethics, which entail respect, respect for persons, avoidance of harm, and fair treatment. So the question is how to localize human dignity in that concept. But relevant with regard to the two global compacts is that they entail a variety of uh, uh, considerations regarding state responsibilities. And Roger thinks the understanding of human dignity should be related to the discussion of the uh, responsibilities of the state. Uh, he says that um, those compacts have three, show three uh, relevant features. Uh, they emphasize the responsibilities of states to um, a shared responsibility to address global migration. Secondly, uh, this, he, they emphasize the centrality of the obligation, obligation to respect, to protect, and fulfill human rights. And thirdly, that these human rights obligations are constraining uh, national sovereignty. So in this setting, there we could expect some kind of implicit um, uh, <coughs> relationship to uh, human dignity. Um, and building on that, he will introduce, I will uh, show that in a minute, he will introduce a, a three-layered understanding of uh, uh, state's responsibilities and will relate different concept of human dignity to this three uh, tired scheme. Um, uh, <clears throat> after that, he will interpret uh, the opening articles of the European Charter in the light of these three tired scheme. And finally, he uh, will ask what is uh, how are, is a statement of the 800 bioethicists? How can that be interpreted uh, in the light of his own framework? So, <clears throat> yes, uh, structure is clear. He starts with an analys analysis of the global compacts. Uh, he will go uh, um, propose his own framework. He will analyze some articles of the European Charter and then go to the statement 
that uh, the uh, events at the uh, American-Mexican borders are, um, uh, how they are um, uh, uh, criticized by the uh, bioethicists. So starting with the two global compacts, um, <clears throat> uh, he emphasized that human dignity is only implicitly present in it. The, uh, but he shows that there are in the, um, <clears throat> uh, what the points are where they are implicitly present, uh, first of all, uh, in the emphasis on the respect for human rights. So that is in accordance with the basic idea that human dignity is a founding foundational principle behind the human rights. Secondly, there is a clear reference to fundamental principles of humanity and international solidarity, which echoes something uh, some aspects of human dignity, and thirdly, quite explicit, uh, is there an emphasis on uh, repatriation uh, has to be uh, has to happen uh, under conditions of safety and dignity. So there we find an explicit uh, reference. Um, but the relevant point for him is so. So if human dignity would just be related to this latter aspect then its uh, role in the entire migration and refugee debate would be very limited. Um, and uh, he said that's quite implausible. So we have to do some work in reconstructing uh, an implicit meaning. And that has to start with distinguishing three levels of state responsibilities and on all these levels, uh, some concepts of human dignity play a specific role. By distinguishing on which level human dignity uh, can be understood, we uh, develop a framework which uh, enables us to uh, differentiate different uh, commitments that are articulated by reference to uh, human dignity. Um, so one could, before he comes to his three labors, he, 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 says, he says, okay, one could in the first instance think, think the task of a state is to balancing conflicting interests. If he understands a state like that, and certainly that is a task of the state, but if, he, if that would be the entire story, we... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, all possible outcomes of this balancing would be equally good. So there must be some criteria to uh, uh, <clears throat> um, evaluate which of the possible outcomes of such a balancing process uh, is acceptable or not acceptable. Uh, and uh, this presupposes some broad form of hierarchy. And with the three-tiered uh, uh, <clears throat> scheme, he wants to introduce a form of hierarchy, but it's, it shouldn't be understood uh, as a very static picture. Uh, it's a conceptual distinction, which uh, in the application uh, has to be um, <clears throat> yeah, need some hermeneutic work, it's my word, uh, in order to uh, apply it. So <clears throat> the first tire of state responsibility he sees as cosmopolitan and non-negotiable. The second and third are uh, much more contingent. Um, and he assumes that there is a kind of hierarchy between these three levels and uh, that it's uh, important to think that uh, even within these three uh, levels, there can be specific conflicts which as well need some kind of 
hierarchization. So <clears throat> when referring to uh, commitments to humanity, uh, Brownsport assumes that there is a state responsibility for the common. Uh, <clears throat> um, the commons uh, comprises the basic conditions for human social existence. So uh, whatever kinds of outcome balancing processes have, they have to be assessed uh, whether or not they are, <clears throat> in, they are compatible with those basic conditions of <coughs> human social existence. Um, and these conditions are, first of all, uh, related to the biological needs of human beings. Uh, secondly, they are related to uh, uh, the capacity for agency of human beings. Uh, <clears throat> Sorry, that I, um, yeah, that, that comes, so uh, I go through it. So th there is a specific bottom line in which um, the functioning of human beings within a community of agents must to be uh, ensured. Uh, and yeah. These are, sorry, uh, first of all, the essential conditions for human existence, uh, existence, so human biological needs. Second, generic conditions for human agency and self-development, so that we are capable of uh, uh, leading a, um, a meaningful life. And thirdly, the essential conditions for the development and practice of moral agency. Uh, so the latter would be uh, not just uh, being able to uh, act as uh, agents in general, but to act as agents which in uh, the context, the condition of an, as he calls it, aspirant moral community. So there is a, there must, the conditions must be protected that we are capable to living in a moral community which has some moral aspirations. And in this latter regard, he says, okay, in first instance, these, the, the aspirations can be very diverse. Uh, so there, there is a possibility, and, and he mentions uh, some uh, examples from his work in bioethics. Uh, so it's possible that in some societies, um, biotechnologies are regulated more uh, um, restrictive and conservative and other uh, more liberal. So in the beginning, is there some space for uh, diversity, but this moral plurality has to be embedded in the general conditions of the commons. Yeah? Uh, so uh, that is the most, uh, the most broad uh, uh, concept, uh, uh, context in which normative assessments have to take place, so biological needs, generic conditions of agency, and th that means uh, those conditions which we need in order to make free uh, uh, decisions, uh, to make choices and stuff like that, and then the conditions necessary to live in an aspirant moral community. And there are the different aspirations can be different. So human dignity can be related to this first level of state responsibility, namely the responsibility for the commons. But uh, there is as well the second level, and that is regulatory responsibility for uh, uh, the community's fundamental value. Um, and here as well, we find human dignity on the second level as the articulation of uh, those commitments modern societies after the Second World War have embraced. Uh, 
it's clear. So it's 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 clear that we have a, the state has some responsibilities for the commitment we have under uh, have uh, signed, but these commitments are uh, have to be constrained by the general commitments on the level of uh, 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 responsibilities for uh, the commons. Uh, and it's clear that here the, uh, the commitments in Europe, in the US, in China can be of different kind. Yeah? So we find a concept of human dignity that is um, uh, intertwined with the values and the self-understanding of specific uh, uh, societies, but they are constraints within these broader framework of responsibilities for the common. So just uh, a bracket so that could relate to my research on China, which you uh, uh, said. So, so um, one of the big problems, now I speak, yeah. Uh, one of the big problems in, in this discourse is that uh, it's often assumed that European and Asian values, uh, 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 European and Asian values would be uh, inconceivable uh, uh, fighting against each other, so the uh, clash of civilizations, if you want. And um, uh, framing it in the way Roger does allows for the fact that human dignity is here interpreted in various forms, but that they are necessarily embedded in a broader picture where uh, our self-understanding as human beings is at stake, which necessarily uh, um, entails a specific responsibility for the conditions under which those um, <clears throat> uh, different value systems uh, can be developed and can flourish. Uh, so, that is the second level, and the third level <clears throat> is a regulatory responsibility to seek an acceptable balance of interest. Yeah? And here, the states are quite, on the third level, states are quite free to uh, find all kinds of arrangements which are uh, uh, um, uh, um, which, which are feasible to accommodate the conflicting interests in, within their societies. And the outcome is more or less depending on yeah, different uh, just feasible uh, ways to go forward and to mediate uh, those <coughs> uh, conflicting interests. Now, having these three levels, <coughs> Roger goes now to the EU Charter of uh, uh, Fundamental Rights, and particular the first articles. So the articles uh, two and three um, about right to life and physical mental integrity. Uh, article four and five, uh, torture, inhumane decaying treatment punishment against slavery, human trafficking, and so on. Uh, particularly, he refers to 3.2, which uh, applies these uh, general right to integrity to <coughs> developments in medicine and biology. Um, and uh, for all of them, uh, he wonders to what extent uh, these provision reflect uh, specific responsibilities on the level of the commons or particular commitments uh, which the Europeans have. Uh, and so, so, so he comes to the insight that uh, the bioethical um, applications, for example, will probably reflect quite specific commitments of a European value system are not necessarily um, <clears throat> uh, fundamental commitments uh, on, uh, on the level of the commons. Um, and here, re relevant from his point, so first of all, relevant is uh, it's not clear right from the beginning 
which provision is, has to be understood on which level. Yeah, so it's a matter of interpretation, and it's possible that specific interpretations of specific articles uh, belong to one or the other level. Yeah, so that's not decided right from the beginning. That's a matter of uh, discourse and interpretation. But the relevant point is now that uh, uh, the, <clears throat> um, the claim that human dignity is inviolable cannot apply to all of the three levels at the same, on the same way. Yeah, so <clears throat> inviolability will only apply to the first level, uh, <clears throat> uh, while the other two levels are uh, more contingent. And, and once again, it's not clear right from the outset what, how to understand all these articles. Yeah, so it's a heuristic distinction which helps us to understand whether or not specific violations of specific provisions, uh, how intense and uh, how uh, um, heavy uh, <coughs> their weight is. Um, an interesting example is, for, exam for, for example, here he discusses uh, the point, the preference for the human touch. Uh, that's something, so he uh, refers to a book of Sherry Tur Turkles, uh, a book Alone Together, where uh, the case is discussed whether human beings want to be uh, treated by robots, so uh, the, these uh, uh, robots in the nursing home and so on, uh, <clears throat> is that an option? And in that context, the preference for human touch is articulated. Now, there is a sense of human dignity which is reflected here, so that the people feel deeply alienated by just being uh, surrounded by, by robots. Uh, but the point is, is that the understanding of human dignity which is inviolable? Yeah, so is there not room for uh, uh, um, contestation, is there not room for uh, plural, <coughs> sorry, uh, opinions. Now, starting from here, he goes now to the um, letter of the 800 bioethicist regarding events on the uh, uh, American-Mexican border, and he uh, he says in the way they understood it, it's more uh, a critique uh, related to uh, so an internal imminent critique of uh, U.S. government policy um, related to uh, communities' fundamental values and not. Uh, 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 re referring to a cosmopolitan and universal um, uh, standard, but uh, the question would be whether or not one could uh, see that uh, in an other way. Uh, and um, That relates to all the questions relevant now for our project. So his outline um, here is, um, is, he discusses now some details which I will skip, but the, the relevant point is here, um, we should, um, all the different claims you can make with regard to the treatment of refugees are, and, and, and they are the, the way they, uh, uh, the question whether or not they form dignity violations has to be assessed under the perspective uh, on which uh, level of state's responsibility you are, um, you are talking. So Roger does not offer a solution here, he just offers uh, a framework and some implications uh, following uh, from that. Um, 
so perhaps I, c I can add that uh, in some sense, what Roger is uh, trying to do here reflects a bit a difference uh, Jos Phillips and I tried to introduce in our first uh, conceptual map for Nova Migra, namely the distinction between rights and values. Uh, and in some sense, I think Roger does uh, a quite sophisticated work in offering us a perspective in which we could see uh, that what uh, Jos and I try to distinguish, to see it in a, a, a combined uh, perspective. And I, I think in that regard, his paper can be helpful for the further discussion uh, within uh, Nova Migra. Um, so um, now Roger is finished and I take over. <laughs> I should have a hat, which I... <laughs> uh, um, and so I think uh, Roger's paper is worthwhile um, in, in various regards. First of all, I think uh, he's right that dignity is uh, in those contexts mainly and should be mainly articulated implicitly. So if we understand dignity as a basis of the human rights, then uh, you don't have to add every, every time and human dignity, but it's an implicit part of the functioning of the, uh, the system. And he is right in uh, um, <coughs> resisting against the temptation to reduce human dignity to the problem of degrading treatment. Yeah, so, uh, uh, so his uh, uh, proposal to use human dignity as an entry to uh, as an entrance for a hierarchization and a structure of the different state uh, uh, um, uh, uh, responsibilities of the state, I think, is a very uh, a worthwhile consideration. And I think he's right in assuming that on the highest level, the state's responsibilities have a cosmopolitan uh, uh, role and has to do with protecting the generic conditions of agency. So th these conditions we all share as human beings, and that has a clear link to environmental rights we discussed earlier. Uh, so if one has commitments to human rights, environmental rights are necessarily uh, an undeniable part of it. So and each uh, uh, understanding of human rights would fail, which is not capable of uh, integrating that. Um, <clears throat> um, there are some complications, however, where I think one has to go uh, to, to ask a variety of further questions uh, that Roger did not so far articulate. And I think these questions have to do with, uh, I, I just want to mention two aspects. One is, <clears throat> the distinction between the first two levels um, presupposes that there is a clear distinction between the values of a specific community and the level of the commons. Um, now, I mean, he does not say that this is bound to the values of a nation state. Yeah? So it's a formal distinction which could be applied to different forms of organization of the international order, if you want. Yeah, it's just a formal distinction. But um, we, we have to wonder how this distinction can function in a situation where the problem is not so much the global level, if you want, but the national level, uh, namely where uh, the different distinguishing communities are not sure anymore what their values are what their status are, is, and where they uh, violently, I think regarding Brexit we can say violently, uh, <clears throat> try to reconstruct a, a value order that they perhaps sometimes had, probably never had. So uh, the, the question is, uh, so the, the distinction Roger made make, um, has to be more further developed in a situation <clears throat> where we don't have homogeneous states with value convictions, but a huge 
diverse <coughs> uh, situation where uh, states are one actor, but there are internet communities, there are uh, <coughs> companies globally uh, combined, and so on. And in <coughs> all these levels, uh, particular uh, uh, value commitments play a role, but where <coughs> it is hard to see how they can live together. And the, the problem is, of course, and there he has a clear statement, human dignity forces us to see whatever normative commitment we have to place them within the fundamental responsibility for the commons. Uh, and that, of course, is the big problem at the moment where <coughs> the, for, for, I mentioned Brexit already, where the normative commitment, if you can speak about normative commitments in the first place, uh, of these people is to, uh, that they don't want to have these uh, 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 global commitment in the first place. So we have to wonder how this distinction can, uh, that, that he proposes can be applied in a situation where the relation, where uh, the particular values and uh, the particular commitments uh, and their status is not so clear uh, anymore. <clears throat> so that, that's the one uh, uh, thing I think we, we uh, more has to be done. <clears throat> uh, the second aspect I want to discuss is um, <clears throat> uh, th these responsibilities for the commons, which he says uh, emphasis so much. Um, has a kind of presentistic dimension and a kind of long-termistic dimension. So, <clears throat> uh, if we are responsible of, for creating or maintaining an order in which uh, uh, people are capable of uh, um, <clears throat> getting their right claims fulfilled in different ways, um, then the question is how we, uh, yeah, what does it mean when most of the questions we are confronted with at the moment uh, have to do with a long-term perspective, and I think particularly about climate change. And so where <clears throat> um, specific restrictions today are necessary in order to maintain an order on the long time. And <clears throat> th th there are specific conflicts in the picture, which I think are uh, very fundamental. And they <clears throat> have all to do uh, with the questions how um, the values and the interest of particular groups can fit into uh, a longer term perspective that is feasible. Now, that is something uh, that would have to be integrated in uh, uh, such a picture, and that um, could mean uh, that restriction of specific liberties, but as well restriction of responsibilities we have for, with regard to migrants, have to be constrained in a long-term perspective. Uh, I don't say how that, what, what the consequence would be. I just want to mention a problem. Yeah, and um, uh, that's something Roger does not mention, <clears throat> but um, at least the, the, pro the, the problem is, so in, in his entire picture, I think the second level, so the particular values of particular communities is the most problematic one, if you want, because it's uh, in development, it's fluent, it's, uh, it's um, difficult to pinpoint. Uh, if we want to spell it out, in, there are the Italians, the Germans, and the Dutch, uh, and there is Europe, and then there is the UN. Uh, so if that would be the translation into real politics, it wouldn't work. Yeah, so we have a much more uh, complex picture, and uh, that means his categories would need some kind of dynamization uh, in order to be applicable for the confused situation uh, we are in uh, at the moment. But uh, having said that, 
uh, I think he is right in uh, assuming that um, human dignity has always uh, these different layers and is, uh, or is disputed on these different levels. Yeah. And then, um, if you understand that, uh, it, um, it has a liberating side. So it's, it's very possible that the Germans discuss human dignity in the light of their very history after the Second World War and understanding human dignity primarily uh, as uh, a prohibition for total objectivation of human beings has an understandable aspect of it, but it's not the entire picture. Yeah, so it, yeah, the problematic past aspect of German is more that the highest Supreme Court has fixed the meaning of human dignity in a way that, uh, that it's very difficult to uh, to get movement in it, but there is a plausible dimension of interpreting in this in this specific value perspective. But to uh, uh, um, so the take-home message from my side could be: uh, human dignity is always uh, a concept that can only work uh, on different layers, and probably that is true for all concept, which is quite fundamental. So every concept of this quite fundamental cannot be developed as a one-dimensional one, otherwise uh, it would not be so fundamental. Thanks a lot. If you ask questions, please uh, ask, uh, tell me in which, with which <laughs> hat I have to answer them. <laughs> I was just saying that. Thank you very much for this double job. I don't think you can answer any name of Rogers Browns, but, but you can try also this. So if there are any questions. Yeah, thank you, Marcus. Maybe uh, it follows up on the last thing that you were saying. Can you hear me? Yeah, now it's better. Now you can hear me. It's a question both to Roger Brownsworth and yourself, I suppose. So it seems that he starts out by assuming that the duty side of the story lies with uh, states. So they are in charge of protecting dignity at the different layers. Um, but following up on your, what you were saying last, one might expect that the duties story perhaps should be slightly more complicated. So maybe you can either on his behalf or on your own uh, behalf elaborate a little bit on that. So uh, the acoustics was also good. So I understood you right that you asked whether or not the duties are only on the side of the state. Yes. Yeah, so um, I mean, Roger starts his analysis by uh, uh, referring to specific existing treaties. And their responsibility of the state is a starting point. Yeah, so uh, for him, that's, it's, I mean, what he is doing is an elaboration of the logic behind these global compacts. Yeah, and therefore, uh, he uh, focused on duties of the state. Uh, I myself think that's not decided right from the beginning. So I think it's, uh, it's um, uh, open for discussion to what extent uh, the most effective way of rights protection is done by states uh, or in a specific combination by a variety of actors. Yeah? So I personally would say, uh, the, the, I skipped that, but um, I wrote it down. So I think um, with regard to long-termist uh, considerations, we would have to wonder uh, whether we have to create another political global structure that is more effective with regard to rights enforcement. Uh, and for this structure, it's not eo ipso clear that the states are the primary or the only actors, but the relevant point would be that we have to wonder um, how can prevention of and uh, prevention of rights enforcement, uh, uh, rights violations, how is that possible? And whatever structure is, uh, uh, is capable of 
and uh, capable to enforce that and feasible to reach uh, is prima facie uh, um, not unacceptable, so to speak, uh, but that leads to a, a, a series of follow-up questions. So thank you very much for your double role. You did very well, impressively, I would say. Uh, may I ask a question that perhaps is not uh, uh, your primary responsibility, uh, since you are not Roger Brownsworth? Can you hear? I, I do my, uh, not so well, but I do my best. Shall I scream a bit? OK. Uh, about the first level, the first level that you mentioned, that is the, the level of the commons. Um, there is, uh, in, uh, as a matter of fact, a strange situation, I mean, a, in, in which uh, uh, the commons, apart from being uh, the result of a philosophical definition, uh, are also taken care of by a number of international or global regimes. So there is uh, the United Nations uh, Convention for the Law of the Sea that is very powerful concerning environmental matters and especially uh, marine ecosystem. Uh, there is the World Trade Organization that matters a lot to the farmers in India and their life, for example. There is the International Organization for Intellectual, World International Organization for Intellectual Property, and there are about two thousands of these global regimes. They have this kind of self-justification. Uh, we do something that defines and rationalizes universal commitments uh, and we help the world to function on the basis of some uh, uh, regulatory rationality. Uh, in truth, they are pursuing some specific objectives like the liberalization of commerce uh, or some other times the protection of the environment uh, up to a certain point, and so forth. So my question is, uh, if the commons are under the purview of uh, international and global regimes that are very efficient and are very strong, and it is very difficult for states, they, states do not have the option. Uh, you cannot say that they can entry or exit, they are in, whatever they do. Uh, state responsibilities uh, become something very close to accepting the definition of what is universalizable and is common that is made by global regimes. So this is a problem that might, uh, this definition of the commons might be in conflict with uh, our philosophical definition of uh, uh, the part of the commons that is implied by dignity, for example. And the second question, but it's very short, is <laughs> that uh, the regulatory part, that is the third level, where the states are free to manage their, the, I mean, collective interests as they wish, uh, provided that they have uh, complied with the level two and the level one, well, the regulatory part, I believe, is uh, underestimated, so to speak. The, the world is completely ordered by regulation. Uh, and this kind of regulatory power that has been called, in many venues, global administrative law, that is simply regulatory power that does not imply any democratic legitimacy or legislative output, uh, is what uh, 
uh, pierces the veil of the states that uh, most of the times uh, uh, have no way to avoid the capacity of regulatory arrangements coming from outside to determine what is to be considered the common. So there is a, a lot of complexity in this situation in which uh, uh, we can use the layers uh, as, a, uh, as a guide, but still, uh, as a matter of fact, we have to confront this uh, maybe aspiration of distinguishing the three levels with the fact that they are very interconnected. Yeah, um, they are interrelated, that's clear, I think. Um, these three uh, uh, levels, um, but that's not a reason not to uh, to work so with this distinction. Yeah, and uh, one shouldn't understand it in a way that um, <coughs> the primacy of this responsibility for the commons means that it's clear by right from the beginning uh, that the responsibility for that is on the level of um, <clears throat> of those institutions, like uh, the UN institution and so on. So one could as well think about uh, another structure in which um, the distribution of uh, responsibilities is differently organized. So, and uh, I think in the paper of Brownswatch that's not uh, uh, determined right from the beginning. It's a matter of uh, feasibility and whether it works. Yeah? So, and uh, a normative aspects come into the picture uh, in the moment where uh, it would be the case that these institu uh, global institutions were just asking acceptance. Yeah? So if not a, a meaningful way of, uh, um, of, of the different parts of the world to influence this uh, global structure uh, would, uh, would be possible. But so for Brownswatch, the relevant point is those things where the commons are uh, responsible, where the states are responsible for the commons are those things uh, that are necessarily required in order to enjoy other rights. Yeah? So you cannot seriously say we want to uh, live under free conditions if, uh, in a global uh, sense, the conditions in order to stay to live free are undermined. Yeah, so that's uh, just logically um, uh, uh, inconsistent. And uh, <clears throat> so, so it's not the picture that necessarily um, the, the responsibility for the commons has to be on the side of global institutions, yeah? Um, or how these institutions should work. You know, so there, I think, uh, is a lot of um, place for contestation on, and debate. Uh, and I personally think that uh, the global institutions have to undergo some severe uh, changes at the moment. But I think, um, so some years ago, I thought, like a lot of other people, that the global institutions would be the problem and their functioning. In the meantime, I think they function much better than the nation states. And that's a surprising discovery of the last, uh, last years, that the, the European Parliament, the European Commission are well-organized institutions <laughs> related to some, uh, some states in that sense. And so, so the, um, the, the I mean, I share probably the experience of all of us that something like the erosion of the British institution is something we have never, could have never imagined uh, a while ago. And uh, so, yeah, but, but that's a matter of, yeah, of discussion. Yeah, to, we don't, that cannot be settled on uh, uh, the level of political, uh, of philosophical distinctions. Yes, I, I have a question for, I think, Roger and Marcus in the point kind of where you kind of share um, kind of the approach to human dignity, but maybe also to the other speakers on the, on the other values. Um, 
And it relates, in a way, to what you have been confirming in Roger's paper also for yourself, namely this implicit meta-structure uh, of human dignity. I mean, kind of to kind of zoom out a little, I mean, in the, in the philosophical discussion, I think um, approaches referring to values instead of norms, principles or so, to me seem to have in the last decades not being one of those persons myself, but seem to have the advantage that they could come up with an internally pluralistic position. So kind of a value pluralism is not just a pluralism between different agents holding different values, but it's also possible for one and the same agent to hold different values without having one comprehensive picture kind of, kind of how they are ordered in the end. But you can have different values, they are differently justified, and then you have specific situations. And in these situations, you will balance these values and then come to a decision. Now what I observe in your paper and in Katrin's paper, and maybe also kind of in, in what you were saying this morning, I have the impression that there's a tendency in, in several, I don't know the other papers uh, yet, there's a tendency for, of each of you to somehow interpret the one, the one value you're discussing as the meta value, the lead value, that is somehow ordering the others and telling the others um, kind of what they are, so the other values, what they are supposed to do uh, in the picture. So my first question is obviously, is, is this impression right? <laughs> Second then, so why should human dignity be better than justice or freedom or maybe citizenship uh, or equality and so on? Um, yeah, so kind of what is the particular character? And the last thing is, I think this, this internal pluralistic perspective was and maybe still is very attractive to law because you can then say law is promoting different goods and then you have specific situations, and in these situations, kind of the different goods are being balanced against each other and then promoted. If kind of this project or the philosophical discussion comes up again with a comprehensive picture, where basically everything is ordered beforehand, uh, then kind of it seems as if kind of law would not have this balancing, deciding function anymore in specific cases, but there would rather be kind of a big program where everything is already decided. So now I answer. Um, so I... Um, The already saying that the difference the four values of the EU Charter are values in which we have, can have pluralistic views on, um, I think is missing the fundamental point, namely that uh, these concepts are only meaningful if we understand their mutual relationships. So I, I think it's it's, um, it would be the picture you not defend but describe is a misrepresentation, I think, of whatever position you can have to that. So um, I think everybody who wants to say something meaningful about the relationship of freedom, solidarity, dignity, justice has to have a kind of perspective how these things can systematically be interrelated. Yeah, so for example, uh, the presentation this morning referring to Anna Arendt's rights to have rights, um, that we, we would have to discuss now how is that related to dignity, because in some sense one could say human dignity is the right to have rights, but in my presentation of human dignity is already presented in a specific way where the other concepts uh, play a specific role. Yeah? Now, uh, I, th I think the meaningful discussions go about, uh, uh, will deal with the question how possible integrations of these different concepts will look like. Yeah? And, and there, Roger proposed a, a picture this morning, and others can uh, 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 make other, uh, uh, propose other pictures, and we can discuss that. But just to say there are 
are different values and now uh, pick and choose and have different uh, priorities. I, I, I mean, it's an, I think then law would not be understandable. Yeah? So the authority of law would be hardly, uh, would be difficult to understand. Um, you have to present a picture that at least in some basic structures strive for uh, being comprehensive. Now, and then, we, then the discourse is open. Then we can wonder uh, which, what kind of um, integration of different dimension of human normativity are more plausible than others. And there I'm happy to uh, discuss, but I think just talking about value pluralism misses the point that we are not committed to values, but in these values are always human activity of understanding our normative commitments. Yeah? So it's always um, had always something to do with us interpreting the law, making the law, relating to it, relating to our normative commitments, relating to uh, the, the, the legal dimension, to a moral one, and so on. This attempt of understanding is always prior to whatever values the outcome of such a consideration will be. And if that wouldn't be the case, we wouldn't have the, the joint uh, human space in which we uh, can try to understand things better, develop things better, and so on. So I think your picture is um, probably intentionally uh, under complex, and you were successful in provoking me. Can I just add? Can I just add to, to that? The microphone uh, is not working. No, it's not working. Yeah, OK. Can I just add uh, to your reply? I agree with you. I mean, um, I was really puzzled by the whole presentation for the conference because of this divide between all the <laughs> different values. I mean, because talking about freedom or human dignity, etc., cetera, I mean, they're all connected within a specific view of the human subject, of moral personality. And the debate among us is really what sort of conception of the self, of the human uh, personality, moral personality do, do we have? And um, can we agree? Can we overlap? It's, um, the, the universal we are trying to achieve is a universal in reach doesn't exist. It's pluralistic by definition, but we are building it together through this public discourse, public discussion. So uh, I was really puzzled. I must, I must say, I found it difficult just to concentrate on one value uh, without the connection with the others. I mean, that was my, my problem too, yes. Because it's a discourse. We are talking yeah. to each other and talking, uh, contesting yeah. or decontesting as Michael Frieden says, all these values, yes. Thank you. I see that as a support. I understand that as a support. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it was, uh, it's important what you said, because I mean, we had some 20 years ago an attempt to speak about, in, in bioethics, to speak about the, the, the European principles, yeah, so that there were an attempt, uh, Peter Kemp and others, Randolph, <clears throat> who said, yeah, these American bioethicists, they had these four principles of Beecham Childress, uh, autonomy, uh, beneficence, maleficence, and justice. And they were understood as being principles where, um, which you always have to specify and weigh against each other. Yeah, but the, the, the balancing of principles would be the main game of uh, philosophical consideration. And then Peter Kemp and others said, yeah, that are the American values, yeah? And we have European ones, and he came with uh, dignity, vulnerability, and some other stuff, uh, which where I thought, I mean, I think it's a fundamental misunderstanding what these concepts could ever mean. Yeah, so it's, for example, vulnerability is not a principle, it's a pre uh, pre uh, necessary pre uh, presupposition in order to have a moral and, and political problem in the first place. If we wouldn't be vulnerable, um, <clears throat> there would be nothing to be solved, so to speak. So these things refer to each other, and necessarily so. And 
that's the process of understanding. I fully agree with you. Any other questions? I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure if that's taken the discussion too far. But uh, on. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure if that's taken the discussion so far because uh, but we raised the matter or you raised the matter about how these principles are intertwined and so on and you raised the matter at the end of your talk as yourself I think that the German constitutional court said uh, that dignity is basically only the prohibition of objef objectification whether that's only or already something quite encompassing is, an, is another matter. But if we look at the jurisprudence of the German Constitutional Court, following all that, the German Constitutional Court has combined various principles, dignity with other fundamental rights and other fundamental principles in the German Constitution that could be a way to understand how structurally, how legally these principles of freedom and dignity of social state and dignity can be combined. Do you think that is um, that could be an approach that could further the, the discussion, the insight, or what's your view on that? Now that's now a, um, I mean that's a huge discussion now. Uh, I, I think that the German debate on human dignity has some advantages because it's so elaborated. It has as well some huge disadvantages. Uh, Markus Rotha wrote a book on human dignity which shows <clears throat> a lot of these tensions. Uh, I think there is a fundamental misunderstanding in the German debate, and that has to do with the name Günther Dürich and the idea that human dignity is a fundamental value uh, decision of the German state. I think that's just rubbish. Uh, and uh, the problem is that this uh, um, uh, concept of Dürich was uh, affirmed by uh, the highest court. And um, Dürich tried to deal with the, the problem that human dignity is, uh, in, in the German concept, um, is trumping all other legal consideration, if you want. If you do that, you are in, <clears throat> uh, f confronted with a problem that only in some respect this trumping is possible. Yeah? And then he comes with the idea <clears throat> that only a full uh, objectification of the human being would th that what is uh, fully prohibited. So. <clears throat> um, uh, I think in the line of what Brownsward uh, presented, uh, it makes sense to have a specific idea of inviolability in that sense as part of an understanding of human dignity, but really only as a part of it. And um, I'm aware that German lawyers do, does a, are doing a lot to embed that in a broader picture. Um, whether or not that is helpful for a European debate, I'm not so sure, um, because it's a very, they are not very willing, is my experience, to relate their particular interpretation to, to other legal uh, traditions. So if, I must confess, being a German from origin, uh, I had for long years problems to deal with human dignities because the discussion with German lawyers was so unpleasant. They always tell you if you have a philosophical problem, but the highest court have already solved it. And that, for a philosopher, is not a very inspiring uh, situation. So I, I felt only uh, comfortable of dealing with human dignity when I moved to Holland. Uh, and uh, nobody were forcing me in any legal uh, perspective. So and I could start thinking freely about it. Uh, but uh, it's clear that uh, the German a juridical discussion has developed a lot of distinctions which uh, which are important for the for the international debates that's no uh, no doubt about it but um, um, when I referred to this point that what more um, that, that I mean human dignity in the German debate is always informed by the historical narrative in the background 
uh, it's it's a uh, yeah it's Auschwitz which is, which is in the background and to some extent I think this narrative is misguiding uh, because it suggests um, that human dignity the application of human dignity should have only to deal with resistance against dictatorships and uh, this form of genocide and so on while what what Roger is talking about about the commons and the possibility of human life, nowadays have to do with totally different things. I mean, if you think about climate change and digitalization and so on, there Auschwitz is not the paradigm for understanding it. It's deeply misguiding to think uh, human dignity has just only to do with this type of application. No. I mean, today we, we have totally different forms of struggles and the picture of the mid-20th century uh, creates a creates a problem in the moment where we think only that is the context uh, in which we uh, could think about human dignity. Or, the, or take Philip from Paris, uh, uh, think about um, <coughs> dignity and language. Yeah? So I think Philip has a, has a clear point there that uh, uh, the way you, uh, you are free or not too free to deal with your language has something to do with human dignity. I'm, I'm fully sure about that. Uh, and, and, and that's a completely different context than, uh, uh, than the Holocaust. Yeah? So, we, uh, um, so we should not uh, just uh, um, restrict our, the discourse in this uh, particular sense. And that, I think, is a more, uh, besides the legal technicalities, that is a much more uh, uh, fundamental uh, problem in the German discourse. Perhaps people want to have no. lunch. Yeah. Yes, I <laughs> but I saw some. Okay, so I think it's better to stop for lunch. And uh, anyway, there will be place for discussion also tomorrow at the round table. And uh, we will meet here at three o'clock p.m. Uh, for the section on equality and freedoms. Thanks again to Marcus Douglas, and thanks to everybody. <laughs>